I flew one of the strangest transatlantic routes. This 9-hour flight on a Boeing 767 took me from Frankfurt, Germany to Whitehorse, Yukon, Canada. At first, this might not seem that strange, until you realize that Whitehorse has a population of just 28,000. It is by far the smallest Canadian city to have a transatlantic flight, and that's exactly why I had to try this route. With that, good morning from Frankfurt Airport. My name is Alex, and I've genuinely been waiting years to take this flight. Today, I'm flying with German airline Condor on their Boeing 767 in premium economy. Condor is one of Germany's largest leisure carriers, and currently flies a mixed fleet of Airbuses and Boeings. During the summer season, Canada is a fairly popular destination for Germans, and Condor flies to quite a few cities there. Today's destination isn't just any regular one though, and Condor only flies this route once a week between June and September. But why Whitehorse, and why does this route even exist? Well, if you'll forgive a bit of backstory, I visited Whitehorse for the first time three years ago, and had an amazing trip. While I was there, I filmed one of those very Condor flights coming in from Frankfurt, and a couple months later, made a video talking about why this route exists. Essentially, it boils down to the fact that German tourists really like visiting the Yukon, with all of the wilderness, scenery, and open space it has to offer. When you consider that only a select few Canadian cities with much larger populations have transatlantic flights, it's quite remarkable that this route has been able to sustain itself seasonally for over 20 years. Long story short, it seems people found that video interesting, so given that, and just how unique the route is in the first place, I knew this was one I had to try for myself. Unfortunately, 2020 happened, and 2021 was still kind of... eh, and it wasn't until June 2022 that Condor officially returned to Whitehorse. So, I found myself a relatively cheap one-way ticket towards the end of the season in September, and here we are. Frankfurt Airport is one of the busiest airports in Europe, home to German flag carrier Lufthansa, and a fairly large base for Condor. While wandering around after security, I saw this sign, and knew I had to go check this out. It turns out, close to Air Canada's Maple Leaf Lounge, there's actually an open-air plane spotting deck. Obviously, it's not a panoramic view by any stretch, but it's so cool to actually have this view post-security in open air. I stayed here for about an hour just watching planes go by, including a rare A318, this MEA A321neo, a Singapore Airlines A380, and more. Condor will be steadily replacing their 767s with A330neos over the next couple of years, and temporarily took on four A330-200s as part of their transition. Interestingly, for a couple of weeks, my flight was actually scheduled to be operated by a Smartlinks A330-300. That eventually got swapped back to the 767, which is probably for the best since those won't be around for much longer with Condor. After some good whiffs of jet fuel, it was time to go find my gate, which, as it turned out, was a bus gate. Even better. Like I said before, this route has been flown by Condor for over 20 years, so it's not a new one by any stretch. Still, it's just one of those fascinatingly obscure aviation things that interests me to no end, so I was very excited to experience it for myself. Welcome to your Condor flight to E2426 to with that, we hopped on the bus across the busyness of Frankfurt Airport, with, as you can imagine, some of the coolest views possible. Waiting at stand Victor 114 was the 767 taking us across the Atlantic, this 30-year-old 300ER registered as Delta Alpha Bravo Uniform Alpha. This plane was first delivered to Condor in October of 1992, was briefly transferred to Thomas Cook in 2002, and then went back to Condor in 2004, where it's been since.
Condor 767s have a few different configurations, and this one had three rows of two, two, two angle flat business class seats. I actually booked this in economy originally, but then saw a pretty compelling upgrade offer to premium economy for only an extra $150. So my seat for today's special flight is 8K, roughly in the middle of the premium economy cabin. Condor has 35 of these seats in the 767's typical 232 layout. Waiting at each premium economy seat was this relatively light pillow and a blanket wrapped in plastic. Settling into the seat, there is plenty of legroom for me, and just as I was hoping, there's this excellent engine view too. I'm glad I went with row 8, because I very nearly picked row 7 right in front, and would have been a bit disappointed. Even row 6 further in front isn't that great, since it's behind these crew rest seats. You can see the IFE screens are at a very weird angle as a result. That seems to be the case on the other side too, so if you care about your window views and your neck, be careful where you sit on Condor 767s. Condor also had an extra bottle of water waiting at each premium economy seat. Premium economy passengers also got this travel organizer courtesy of Condor, as well as these two sleeping and refreshment kits. I'll take a look at those and the details of the seat after takeoff. Eventually, boarding was complete, and unsurprisingly for a flight towards the end of the summer, this was pretty empty. I even lucked out with a free aisle seat, which on a 9 hour flight is a huge win. For what it's worth, Condor was offering upgrades from premium economy to business during check-in for about $300 Canadian, but I decided against it. With all of this free space now, I was very comfortable with that decision. With that, we were pushing back, and here's the departure from Frankfurt off of runway 25 center. Amazing sounding departure heading almost straight north already, let's check out the rest of the seat. Starting at your feet, there's this semi-useful footrest that folds down. Above that is a decently large seat back pocket, and in there was the safety card for the Boeing 767. Condor's duty-free catalog, which had the usual random stuff that nobody would ever possibly buy. Oh, hang on a second, now you have my interest. I might just buy something from Duty Free for the first time ever. Lastly, they've also got this buy on board menu. The tray table here is also decently large and slides out. Condor also has these handy coat hooks at every seat as well. As far as the in flight entertainment goes, it's not bad at all. The screens are fast and responsive, and there's a pretty broad selection of movies and TV shows. They also had some Condor specific content and some terminal maps, except that this map of my hometown airport Calgary, which they didn't even fly to this year, is at least 7 or 8 years out of date. They've also got this fairly basic moving map. It's worth pointing out that we're on a very northerly trajectory, at least compared to other transatlantic flights. That's another special part of this route that I'll talk about later. 
I did have to go back and look closer at why some of the options were called premium movies and so on. It turns out that Economy Class only gets access to two movies and two TV shows for free, and to access the entire library is an extra 9 euros. I gotta say, that's a clever way to get some extra revenue, not that certain Canadian airlines should be getting any ideas. The whole library is included for premium in business though. As far as power goes, there's only a USB port on the screen. Also, at some point while I was filming the taxi and takeoff sequence, the cabin crew member gave out these menus for premium economy. So far, this looked very promising, and I was especially looking forward to that ice cream. For this first service, I decided to go for the chicken, which came in a honey barbecue sauce with some vegetables and mashed potatoes. That also included a starter of pork and lentil salad, plus some cheese, a chocolate bar, and a chocolate mousse for dessert, as well as this bread roll. That all came with, quite possibly, the best salt and pepper shaker I've ever seen. And yes, you bet I kept that for myself. For the starter, the pork and lentil salad worked surprisingly well, and I polished that off almost right away. The chicken was cooked really nicely, and wasn't dry at all. That coupled with the excellent sauce and mashed potatoes made for a delicious main course. The bread roll, however, was a bit dry, but the butter tasted good enough. Finally, the chocolate mousse made for a very good dessert, and wasn't too sweet. All things considered, I was very impressed with this meal service, especially for premium economy. Nicely done, Condor. After our trays were cleared, the crew also offered a second drink service, and I went for a glass of orange juice. Shortly afterwards, the duty-free service started with this video that played on every monitor at once, and I own this now. Unfortunately, this was the only model that they had, and it may not even be remotely the right type or the right livery, but for only 11 euros, it's a nice memento from this flight. As we flew past the North Sea, the cabin lights dimmed, and it's pretty obvious that Condor has put a lot of effort into revamping their interiors. That lighting is not something I would have expected from a 30-year-old 767. As many people took advantage of the empty middle rows for the hours ahead, I took a peek at those amenity kits that the crew handed out before we took off. In the sleep kit, you could find a pair of socks, earplugs, and an eye mask, while in the refresh kit was some lip balm, a wipe, and a toothbrush. All in all, a lot more than I was expecting to get for premium economy. Later on, the crew handed out these Canada Customs Declaration forms, which I hadn't seen in years. Apparently Whitehorse was not set up for the digital stuff still in use at the time, so you did have to fill these out, which I only learned about while in said customs line. Whitehorse is, obviously, much further north than more typical transatlantic destinations, which means the Great Circle routing, or the shortest distance between the two cities, is much further north as well. That leads to us passing over some areas of the high Arctic that you wouldn't normally see on your average Canadian transatlantic flight. Needless to say, I was very much looking forward to those views coming up. Quite appropriately as we crossed the Greenland ice sheet, the cabin crew gave out some cookie dough ice cream, which just happens to be my absolute favorite. That was an amazing treat, and a really nice touch. That was followed by yet another drink service, and I went for this cup of coffee. I was pretty much forcing myself to stay awake for the whole flight anyway, because there was no chance I was missing any views of the high arctic. And I do mean that, already we were well past the 77th parallel north. I also asked the crew if they had any extra ice cream, and they very kindly gave me another one. Eventually, we hit our furthest north point at just shy of the 78th parallel, 77 degrees and 58 minutes north. The northwest coast of Greenland was unfortunately obscured in cloud, as was most of Ellesmere Island, but we did see a tiny bit of the island's southwest corner. After that though, the views only got even better, as we passed over the rest of the Queen Elizabeth Islands. These very sparsely populated islands make up the northernmost portion of the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, and it was such a treat to be able to see these with my own eyes. I think I'll let this montage speak for itself.
eventually passed over some more clouds, and that was sadly the end of our arctic views, but not before I got plenty of pictures and videos. It was nice to see that I wasn't the only one glued to these views outside, as many fellow passengers brought out DSLRs of their own. After that, I took a walk down the back of the 767. Condor's economy class adds another 206 seats, although they are configured with a pretty tight 30 inches of pitch. These lavatories right in the middle of the cabin have plenty of room though. Just after that, we crossed into mainland North America over the Northwest Territories, and these hot towels were given out to premium economy. That was followed by another small meal service, which included a warm margarita panini, a Dijon potato salad with meatballs, another chocolate bar, and a fruit salad. That starter was, once again, very tasty, as was the fruit salad and the panini itself. For anyone wondering how they cater the plane in Whitehorse, well, it turns out they take the meals for the return flight with them. The logistics of this route are pretty interesting, since Whitehorse isn't your typical outstation. All of the ground handling is done by local airline Air North, and the terminal is not the largest by any stretch. Although the longest runway is 9,500 feet, the terminal only has two jetways, of which only one was usable thanks to some apron reconstruction going on. That being said, businesses in Whitehorse absolutely welcome the tourists that this flight brings, and when you get off the plane in the airport, you're greeted in English, French, and German. All of that makes this flight even more fascinating, and I'd be curious to see if they keep this route going with the A330neos. Although niche, it's clearly a popular route, and in the late 90s, Air Transat even flew it once weekly for a few seasons with an L1011. Swiss airline Balair also flew from Zurich to Whitehorse for a time with 767s, and so did Edelweiss Air with A330s. That said, it's not hard to see why Whitehorse is a destination of choice. Located just above the 60th parallel north and along the Alaska Highway, Whitehorse is the largest city in Canada's three territories. Once you're there, it only takes a bit of driving to find yourself in some stunning wilderness. That first time I was there, I ended up taking a flight on a float plane, which was easily the best way to see as much as I could. This time around, I didn't stay too long since I had a connecting flight back home, but I was just there in May, and it's spectacular as ever. Eventually, the peaks of the Mackenzie Mountains appeared through the clouds. The Mackenzie Mountains form most of the border between the Northwest Territories and Yukon, and were the first sign that this unique flight was about to come to a close. We eventually crossed the tree line, and the views coming into Whitehorse never cease to amaze. Here's the arrival onto runway 14 right. Well, that was one of the most interesting transatlantic routes in existence. From the excellent service on board, to the views of the Arctic, to finally landing in Whitehorse on a Condor 767, I couldn't be happier with how this unique flight went. One slight downside of that uniqueness is that it took me a full 75 minutes to get through customs, since there were only two officers and a fair few foreign passports. That was partly because I was one of the last to get off, since I asked for a flight deck visit, but those are always worth it. Aside from the novelty of the flight itself, Condor actually has a really good premium economy product, and I like that it's not priced that much higher compared to normal economy. Condor will be adding newer premium economy seats with the introduction of the A330neos, but on the 767s, the seats are so wide it doesn't matter much. Speaking of which, it was good to get another transatlantic flight in on a 767, as those seem to be quickly disappearing. So, whenever the 767s are finally retired, and this flight maybe gets swapped to the A330neo, I think this unusual transatlantic route might just be worth revisiting. 
Kevin Crew to South Doors. Thank you so much for watching this Years in the Making adventure with Gondor, and I'll catch you next time.